Me? No one's willing to sit in the front row. It's just like, just like school, right? Go to the back row. Um, really nice to have you here. Any teachers in the room? Yay! Any parents in the room? Yay! Hey, parents, here for teachers. Thanks for coming. So we'll get started. I'm Jennifer Joy Madden. And I'm Lisa Klein. And we are parents and child safety advocates, generally speaking. And well-being advocates. And we met through the Screen Time Action Network. Now, what is that? It's part of Fair Play, which is a nonprofit which looks out for kids and the effects of technology on their health and welfare. Um, and uh, it's, it's really more. kind of like a think tank where we bring together researchers, educators like yourselves, parents like yourselves, um, attorneys, like the whole gamut of people to look at this intersection of kids and screen time and what it's doing to them at school, in the classroom. So let me tell you a little bit about Lisa Klein here. She is a hero for Montgomery County, Maryland public schools. Um, she has led efforts to uh, filter out inappropriate content from school issued Chromebooks and to protect student data. She also has written screen time and cell phone guidelines for their 160,000 students. And um, she is now going to Capitol Hill to advocate for kids in this area. I live close by, so that helps. Um, and Jennifer is an author, an adjunct professor at Syracuse University, a health journalist herself, and a digital wellness educator. She's been writing about our relationship and kids' relationship with technology um, on, her, on her website, durablehuman.com, which I encourage you to visit. It's wonderful. Um, and that came out just about the same time the iPhone was released. So no, it was not a coincidence. <laughs> not a coincidence. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, as we go through these, this today, we have to keep in mind that we didn't evolve with these devices. Human beings didn't evolve with them. So they've had unaffected, unexpected effects on us. And, um, and we have to remember they were not designed for kids. So since smartphones began to proliferate, there have been bona fides hits to academic mental health and physical health of kids and their ability to be happy and content, which is really extra disturbing. Um, and as a result, students are less available for learning. So we're gonna talk about that today. And as, as, as parents, um, mostly, we've been observing what's going on in our own homes. Um, the homes of our children, our nieces, our nephews, and really kind of digging in. I've been at this for about 12 years myself, um, and it's really been a change. The classroom doesn't look like it used to when I was there, which is good and bad, but dissecting it, we need to kind of figure out are the human basic needs being met in the classroom to learn uh, for the long term. Um, so I will start with the landscape and kind of look at what is getting in the way of deep learning? We kind of know, um, I don't need to tell you all what's happening with scores nationwide. Uh, things aren't looking so good. So we're gonna I'm gonna focus on ed tech. Um, and then we will get to 10 very promising ways to help get things back on track. So that'll be the good news as soon as I bring <laughs> us down a notch. Um, so in Western countries like ours, Little, little kids are consuming about an hour a day of digital media for fun. YouTube kids, you know, not baby Einstein anymore, I guess that's too passe, but fun, you know, quote unquote, fun technology. And then by age 12, they're up to five hours a day for fun. And by high school, it's seven hours a day. So you add six hours of instructional time in the classroom. And by age 18, kids are on screens for 991 days, or about five and a half years of those 18 years. Put another way, that's about five and a half years of not doing other things. They're not outside, they're not running around, they're not arguing with their siblings, they are not 
baking with grandma, um, fill in the blank, whatever they're not doing. In my house, they're not walking the dog. That's my thing. Um, so all this screen time weakens their academic success at school. Um, the research is very clear about this. Um, I'm not gonna cite research as I go through these numbers, but if you're ever interested in knowing what they are, I have them in my bag. Um, they're, they're bona fide uh, studies that I'm drawing from. So what we know is that even an hour of screen time for fun can drag down your grade by a full letter grade. Two hours a day can drop it another letter grade. Heavy users of screen time are 15% less likely to get a college degree. You can see how this has repercussions beyond just their young years. Career opportunities are impacted um, and general happiness in life can be impacted. Um, so all that screen time is before they even step into the school where educational technology has taken off and taken the classroom by storm. What is ed tech? Very, very simply, it's the Chromebooks, the iPads, it's the hardware, and it's the software. It's Naviance, Pear Deck, Flipgrid, um, of course, Google. Um, and these are all very much for-profit companies in the classroom, and then collectively they make $340 billion a year. Here in the US, EdTech makes more money than the casinos do by about $4 million. Um, this EdTech gold rush took off during COVID, uh, but it happened well before then. But during COVID, um, the federal government gave schools $190 billion to help with remote learning. So we saw a huge uptick. Whereas districts used to have, on average, 548 uh, digital tools at their disposal, now it's over 1,400. And about two thirds of the ed tech that's purchased goes unused, according to an AP study. So that's a lot of waste of $190 million. Um, in my district, teachers only have gotten about a dollar a year in raises over the last 25 years, and our school buildings are totally crumbling. Um, so 190 million would have been really nice to use other ways. Um, okay, so how is EdTech really working out? Is it money well spent? Um, and I'm, I'm afraid the results are a little bit obvious. Um, math and reading skills are at their lowest in decades. And data tells us that countries that invest less in ed tech have kids with higher reading, math, and science scores than those that invest more. So that's kind of the headline for today. My thesis is just that. Um, is the pandemic to blame? Yes and no. Um, remote learning did set the kids back, understandably. We all lived that. Uh, but it also shined light on some of the flaws in the educational technology. Um, the United Nations put out um, a 547-page report on this very topic and concluded that technology just is not adding value in the classroom. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. There's training that needs to be properly done, um, and, and that's, that's the banner over that. But teachers have other things to do. Teachers have a lot of things to do. Um, Apart from that, there's also a recent re re revelation, that word always trips me up, that screen time can actually cause some brain damage. Neuroimaging shows that a loss, well, and it's not even a lot of screen time, moderate amounts of screen time can cause a loss of gray matter. Gray matter is the frontal lobe where executive functioning happens, that's organizing and planning. Um, it also makes the white matter spotty, they call it, and that's the area that controls the brain talking to the body. So, are there any great digital tools out there that are helping kids? I'm sure there are, but we really can't know because there are no standards of effective, effectiveness right now, no measurement tools uh, that are not um, pure, peer reviewed and independent. Um, so I do advocate for those at the Department of Education level. That would be a big improvement. Um, 
And teachers and parents are not asking for evidence. Only 11% surveyed of teachers say that they're actually asking for evidence to say this is working before they deploy it. Um, so there's this other thing. EdTech, I call it a bitch of a, a Trojan horse. They're making money on the licensing, and they're making money on, um, uh, yes, the licensing fees, which can be exorbitant in multi-year contracts. But the Internet Safety Lab also found that 96% of all the apps and platforms in the classroom today are collecting personal data on kids, packaging it up, selling it out the back door. Not all, but 96% are. Um, so that's a big money maker for them. Um, now you will say, but they have privacy. I've seen the privacy policies too. They all have privacy policies. There are third party vendors that make those apps work that aren't making the same promises. Those are called SDKs, um, software development kits. Uh, so, and then there's FERPA. FERPA is supposed to protect kids from all of this as well. Well, a group that I, I work with, the Student Data Privacy Project, uh, tested FERPA in 13 states. It's not working. We filed batch claims to DOE. It's just not working. So now we're going to the FTC for help on that. Um, so EdTech is, is backfiring in some ways, and it goes beyond letter grades. Take writing. Children who learn to write on a computer, they struggle with memorization much more than kids that learn with tactile pencil and paper. Same with reading. E-reading reduces what is called reading stamina. I talked to Judy about this yesterday. Um, and that's the ability to sit for a sustained period of time and really focus on what you're doing and read. We all use it every day. Um, very important. If you are scrolling, you're skimming and you're getting shallow learning. If you are reading with a book, and you can highlight and annotate and dog your pages, you're getting deeper learning. Any fourth, fifth, sixth grade teachers here? Yes, hi. So you guys have the power because that is when, as you know, the shift happens from learning to read to reading to learn. And if we don't solve it, solve it early, the problems will snowball. 16% of students who are not good readers by fourth grade don't graduate from high school on time. I don't know if any of you caught a movie yesterday called The Truth About Reading. Wow, I mean, it was really incredible how, what it does to one's confidence if they don't learn to read well. Um, I do recommend that film, it's sensational. Um, so comprehension and attention are taking a total beating in the 21st century classroom. And so is reading outside the school. Uh, about half as many 13-year-olds say they read for pleasure anymore from 10 years ago. And this really matters because reading for pleasure is highly correlated with doing well in the classroom and mental health. Um, so read, read, read. We like to read. I wish I could read more. Um, switching gears to the user experience of EdTech. I know it can certainly make things easier for teachers, streamline grading and attendance, but it can be kind of quicksand for kids. A friend of mine, Joe Clement, who is an author of a book called Screen Schooled, he is a high school teacher in Virginia, and he told me, I've never had more kids so confused about when things are due and when the tests are than I do in 2024. Um, they say they get so many notifications and reminders that they just turn them off. They become numb to them. Um, but there is one thing that EdTech is really helpful for. I know you know. Cheating. Cheating. Yes, the Wall Street <laughs> Journal has found that cheating is out of control, their words, in the 21st century classroom. Kids are auctioning off homework assignments and sharing um, you know, answers electronically like never before. Um, so EdTech is, is, can be like a shortcut factory. Google's a really good example plug a keyword in and push a button and cut and paste the answer. And then there's AI, which is the elephant in the room, um, which is a, a bit of a shortcut machine on steroids. Um, and if there's ever a time and place for AI, and I'm sure there is, um, it's after the foundations have been established. 
I think we all agree on that. So that's reading, writing, basic math, and the fine art of learning to think and to solve problems, which we all use every day without the crutch of machines. Although we do use the crutch of machines as well. There is time and place for both. Okay, I need to talk about cell phones. Um, the good news is that most schools have a policy, 76% of public schools have a policy to limit cell phone use for academic purposes. The bad news is that academic purposes are everything from doing a Kahoot or a Quizlet in class to looking at a Khan Academy video. Um, so it's really, really impossible to create like a low-tech classroom um, or to create a cell phone-free classroom when you have technology on board. Um, and we know that cell phones tank grades. Uh, it's really hard to focus if there's a cell phone next to you or on you. In fact, the London School of Economics did this study that was replicated at Rutgers, and it showed that an average 6% drop in your grade would occur if JJ's phone is right there and mine's nowhere to be seen. It's even the person next to you. Um, so that's something to think about. But it can also detour teaching. My son's science, science teacher did a little calculation of his own, and he says for 45 minutes a week, he's policing cell phones. So you pull that out over like 39 weeks of school, and it's as if the kids are missing six weeks of instruction because the teacher is pulled by policing the phones. Um, a lot of parents will say, but my kid needs a phone for a lockdown or um, an active shooter situation. Um, I've looked into this extensively. There are a couple of experts I've spoken with and both agree that it's a liability. The phone will give the kid away in hiding with pings and dings. Uh, they'll jam up the lines, um, the signals, trying to reach the parents and the, that, that communication needs to remain open so first responders can get into the school. Phones are really expensive. Cost about $900 a year, just for the plan alone, not to mention the phone. So there's an equity thing going on there too that really needs to be discussed. Um, and then I'll wrap this up and you can hear great stuff from JJ. But screen time is now the top parent concern. It tops cyberbullying, vaping, drug use, which was startling to me, but University of Michigan has come out with this. Um, and we see our kids overdosing on it every day. Too much screen time. At home, for sure, and that is our parent responsibility, but also at school and homework. And guess what? The kids don't really like it. They say they cringe when the teacher says, get out your Chromebook. They like books. You give them the option of a paper packet or doing it online. A lot of them will take the paper. Um, so that brings us to the very basic human needs of kids. JJ, take it away. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I thought about calling my part of this uh, the tale of too many hockey sticks <laughs> because um, the lines for, uh, trend lines for children's health um, and well-being, their mental and physical health, were kind of going along like this for a while. And then suddenly they took a stark turn upward or downward, kind of like hockey sticks. And this happened at a particular time, and it was when um, smartphones and social media began to be ubiquitous among young people. And that was between about 2010 and 2015. So we can't blame COVID in this case. Um, and it's been called the cell phoneization of childhood. And it's kind of the time when what used to be childhood went out the window. Uh, and I think you know what I mean on that one. But beneath it all, we have to remember that kids are kids. They're not digital, they are human. And I like to say they need to get to know their own operating systems before they're introduced to others. So in other words, they need to get to know their minds and their bodies and how they work. Um, you've seen how babies start out, they can't even figure out anything. Well, it continues through childhood to know your body and mind better and better. Um, and so the other thing they need to be able to access is their senses. So sure, the big five, you know, taste, smell, touch, but beyond that, they would be the senses that only we humans have, which are senses of empathy and kindness, um, compassion, 
those things. Ultimately, your sense of intuition, tapping into that, and maybe hopefully setting up some sort of an internal moral compass. There is a need for quiet and for thought, thoughtful processes to go on in children. If they're constantly hearing the drone of outside noise, they may never be able to access these really vital human emotions. And these human qualities haven't changed in kids, but there's tremendous pressure on them right now because of so much use of technological devices and just the pace of life today. Um, and so what we need to do is help kids to be durable. Now, you've heard a lot about resilient, especially in the pandemic, you heard a lot about resilience. And resilient means to be able to get up again after you've been knocked down. To be durable is to be able to stay in balance as you navigate life's bumps in the road. And there's a real difference there. So kids have to develop a certain sense of, you know, uprightness and strength to be able to, to navigate. And we need to help them with that. Um, evidence shows that their durability has dropped in mind, body, and relationships. Um, but we have to understand that life's been more bumpy lately, and so it's been hard for all of us. So if we look at just the physical self of the child, um, it started a while back. Um, I like to say when we all started using laptops, humanity sat down. We really became more sedentary. And so we have to understand they've been staring at us, and we don't get around as much as maybe we should, and so they're seeing that. They are um, less physically active. They have less, um, less movement in their life. And the numbers bear that out. Kids' core strength is down. Um, and in the 60s, uh, one in 20 kids was overweight, and now it's one in five. So that means 20% of kids are sort of in line for those adult diseases, chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. Um, and besides that, in the classroom, kids who haven't gotten it out of their system when they sit down, they haven't moved around enough, they're fidgety and they're, you're, it's harder to get their attention just for that reason. And also, interestingly enough, this has to do with the limbic system, they're emotionally fragile. The younger ones get very frustrated quickly and they also, um, the little ones cry at the drop of a hat. You know, just because there's less time outside and running around. They're supposed to have 60 minutes of activity a day, of just moving around, um, between the ages of 6 and 17. And then, you know, we, we begin to think, you know, how is that even possible these days to find 60 minutes? Well, we're going to find out that you don't have to have a chunk of 60 minutes. So we'll get into that. Um, good old-fashioned unstructured play is rare as we see the empty streets and sidewalks. Um, what's lost there? Play fosters, of course, physical strength and coordination. Besides that though, it's independence when kids don't have anybody telling them what to do and they're just playing. Um, imagination, creativity, um, emotional regulation, as we've talked about, gets kind of the, those woolies out of them you know, to be able to run around. Call it the yayas. The yayas, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> and learning to get along with others. That happens playing with other kids when there aren't adults telling what to do. Um, most people don't realize, and as teachers it's important to know, that kids' eyesight can be affected. Um, interestingly enough, um, not getting enough sunshine and exposure to the outdoors plus being on screens a lot leads to myopia, which is nearsightedness, which you can kind of understand when they're at this focal length for long periods of time, their eyes are gonna become accustomed. So what happens with nearsightedness, you lose the ability to focus on things in the distance. Kids need glasses. Their eyes are permanently damaged for the rest of their lives. Um, so it's pretty significant that they don't get enough time outdoors early on. And um, they are, at risk then for more eye problems later that can lead to vision loss um, because their eyes have been compromised. So uh, we're gonna see that it's also possible to influence that too. So there's a little hope in store here. Um, now, as teachers, 
You've probably seen the heads on the desks and the yawns. I would imagine so. Um, sleep has really taken a hit in the last decade. Uh, the National Sleep Foundation says that six out of 10 middle schoolers and seven out of 10 high schoolers do not get enough sleep on weeknights. This is a profoundly big deal. Um, and, and battles have been fought about buses coming too early for high schoolers. But just to review what the problem is, um, it, lack of sleep contributes to weight gain. Um, it affects the immune system, so there's more sickness and more absences from school. But more important to learning, when we sleep at night, having solid sleep, sound sleep, there's a process that goes on in our brain where the stuff we learn during the day is transferred into long-term memory and that a child who has disrupted or shortened sleep can't undergo that saving process. And so it may be the next day, a couple days later, they try to access that information for the test. It simply may not be there anymore. So you can see <laughs> that lack of sleep leads directly to poorer grades. So as a teacher, it's important to keep that in mind and understand that if you see some of these things, kids uh, who are tired are at more risk for headaches, hyperactivity, depression and anxiety, and just being cranky. <laughs> and we know that cranky kids aren't good classroom citizens. So we would love them to be happy and awake, <laughs> would be the ideal. So what is causing the sleep deprivation? I'll read from the National Sleep Foundation, excess use of electronic devices, especially later in the evening. I think we're kind of aware that the blue light that emanates from screens does affect the body's ability to fall asleep. And so um, the parents are told to turn off the phones from one to two hours before kids go to sleep, and that's why. So other reasons that kids are not as mentally durable or, or their durability is being challenged, let's put it that way. Um, think of this, if you are 25 and older, you ostensibly have a fully formed brain, a mature brain. And so you have the ability at least to, to uh, withstand temptation and to actually try to overcome and focus on what's in front of you. But um, imagine that you're a child with an immature brain and you have a device on your wrist or at your side and it's vibrating every few seconds in the classroom. And how is a child supposed to concentrate? Nearly impossible. So I call that not being able to think straight. And so it's very important when we consider cell phones in the classroom, what's really happening with their, with their minds. Um, ADHD, those rates have jumped 50% over the past 10 years. Um, many neuroscientists believe this comes from hyperstimulation from better and better video games, more intense video games and other types of entertainment media. And then when you try to engage the students in school with, with perhaps stimulating media. It, it feeds an addictive cycle of the child needing more stimulation and then having to add more stimulation. And it, 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 it really is a cycle. And um, gamification, some games that they play, when they get a reward or a starburst or something, they're getting that little hit of dopamine right there. And what is happening and is showing up in research that the kids, rather than developing an inner sense of pride at their accomplishments, they may be craving, craving um, a hit of dopamine. And so um, that's another thing to keep in mind for them. And as for the brain changes that Lisa was mentioning, uh, yes, so all the use of digital devices is implicated in those. Um, nothing is definitively proven yet, but there are many studies going right now that are looking at how this is affecting kids' thinking and behavior. And um, so that's gonna be coming out in the next few years, so it'll be interesting to see. That's the NIH longitudinal ABCD study, right? Yeah, it's that's one of them, yeah. And there's so many different studies under the ABCD study. It's gonna be a big one. Um, so as far as durable relationships, we all need, tight relationships uh, for health and happiness. And the data is showing that more and more students feel alone at school, separated from their peers, because uh, they're being drawn into personal advices that they have to try to keep up 
and they're distracted and it's kind of like they're alone together. And in some schools, you know, this is why these, the cell phones are taken away because the kids will just scatter at lunch and they'll just catch up, you know, that sort of thing. And um, kids are sucked into their devices and what they may be being served up is pulling them into very dark places. So at school, there's an undercurrent of stuff being said back and forth on social media. Um, kids are able to access porn in certain cases and um, the body dysmorphia continues for, for you know, that's this a problem for girls that I'm sure you know about. Um, so having no self, no break from it, no respite, that's what's so hard on the kids. Um, so here come a, a few horrible hockey sticks that I'll just tell you about. In 2019, one in three high school students and half of female students reported persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. These are kids in the prime of their life and they're feeling hopeless. Um, that's a 40% increase from 10 years ago. And to quote the US Surgeon General, there is growing evidence that social media use is associated with harm to young people's mental health. You may have remembered during the pandemic, there was a, a mental health emergency declared among young people. Um, and over a decade, mental health has really taken a deadly dive. Um, by 2018, suicide was the second leading cause of death among 10 year olds. Um, and that is all the ages up to 24, but the 10 year olds really gets me. Um, luckily, there are staff members in school. Um, about 90% of schools have hired on people to help with social emotional issues, which is really great. That's a wonderful thing. Maybe I hope in your school that you've seen them and they're there. Um, if we look at, so looking, starting to look at the brighter side now, if we want to look at a young person's overall durability, um, the whole child, what could be the best balance point would be the child who spends minimal time on devices and playing and, and things like that and meaningful time. So, um, yeah, it could be meaningful. They're having fun in a game. That's, that's uplifting. So it's, yeah, it'd be great if they're learning something, but at least they should be feeling good about it when they walk away. And so that's one of the reasons with the constant barrage of social media, it's like, oh my gosh, I just, they don't feel good. Like we don't feel good sometimes. Um, and so that's, but that has to be coupled with minimal and meaningful uh, consuming of digital media coupled with activities that they need for development, such as chores, jobs for later, you know, later um, ages and uh, sports and, you know, eating dinner with the family with the phones in a basket, you know, that sort of thing. And um, that leads to the most overall health of these kids and ultimately helps them to be most available to learn. So we are going to get to our 10 solutions. Um, I think we have time for uh, a question or two, but first, before we get to questions, um, I think we should all stand up. Let's stand up, just stretch our legs a little bit. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, it's so good to see everyone here on this last day. Anyone staying on for the week? Yeah. Oh, wow. good. Hardcore. Thanks for coming. Nice. Okay, have fun. Um, Any questions? Anyone want to step anybody? up to the mic? Yeah. Yeah. Step up Come to the up. mic. Sorry, I'm sorry. Is it on? Is it on? Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't hear her yet. It's on. Uh, tip it up a little bit. Okay. Try. Hello. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll just tip tip. Um, <laughs> so um, I was 12 years old when the iPhone was launched. Um, now I'm 24, so my brain is not fully developed yet. <laughs> but um, I just remember like growing up with a lot of social media. Um, I was in my third year of college when the pandemic happened. So then I spent the last year and a half living on Zoom and like kind of connecting with my friends that way. So I don't know, I, I've just been very emotionally charged, I would say, throughout your, um, the, like all, all the things that we've talked about today. And um, now I'm 
working in online learning and <laughs> it feels very ironic but I think what um, inspired me to do that was because I didn't have great experiences um, through online learning and I'm trying to see if this is what we have to do right now then like how we can make it um, the best that we can and how we can encourage healthy screen times in the way that, that you're speaking of. Um, about a year ago I did make the move to like remove all of social media so the only thing I have is LinkedIn because we have to work <laughs> um, but and I just remember like from my friends it was a lot of like oh my god are you going off the grid like what's going on are you okay and and all those kinds of things and like how you're gonna know what we're doing and um, those kinds of conversations so I guess my main question would be in the online learning space what can we do um, if we are still designing asynchronous learning for students Yes, and I have a really simple answer to that, but I, I, it's non-scientific, it's just something that I think. When tech is a tool and not a toy, it is serving a purpose. So if it's helping to organize, if it is helping to craft something um, that the teacher can't do, teachers are the most creative people I've ever met, and hardworking, and love kids. So that's an equation you can't get with a digital tool, generally speaking. So if it's, and as you go forth in your career, make sure it is a tool and not a toy. The gamification is a problem. I've seen it in my own home. My son in second grade started, started getting really amped up on Prodigy and you know all these like trinkets he was saying he was winning at school. And I'm like, yeah, but what's seven times six? I don't know. So that flash fast forward to 17 races through everything he does because he thinks it's a game. Unload the dishwasher, walk the dog, you know, have a conversation with me. It's all like so fast. Um, and I attribute it, I really do attribute it to the gamification of his, his elementary years. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I just want to say um, the uh, avoiding screen time has already started for me. Uh, I have a five month old and we, my husband really loves TVs, so we have a 75 inch TV in the living room, but it's so hard to get her to not see that thing. So I'm totally here for less screen time for kids um, and the challenges that you know our society you know kind of puts in place. But I do am curious that about the other causes of some of these stuff that you've been um, listing off, like, um, oh my gosh, what did I write down? So like unstructured play, mm -hmm. uh, like, so things like suburban sprawl, uh, climate change, um, quote unquote stranger danger, like you don't want your kid outside because you don't know your neighbors because you think they might, I don't know, whatever. Um, and then also just like inequities that also cause obesity, it's not just screen time. I'm interested in reading those studies to see if, you know, like what kind of controls they used to, you know, you know, uh, uh, control for other aspects of kids' lives. But uh, what would you say to the multifaceted causes of some of these issues that you're talking about? Well, absolutely. I think the built environment has a lot to do with it. So in my book, uh, How to Be a Durable Human, I talk about the neighborhood and so you actually, if you, where you choose where you live is gonna determine, almost determines your health. Because if there are sidewalks, exercise becomes a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And so that's so important. And um, so that's one thing to consider. And uh, climate change, yeah, if the air quality is poor, you know, you wanna keep them, keep them in that day. So yes, it's, it's definitely yeah, multifaceted. Yeah, I don't know what summer's gonna look like with me and my seven month old, right? Like I can't really take her out. And I was pregnant during the summer. I couldn't go outside because mm -hmm. it was 104. Oh yeah, the heat. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so then you do have to find some indoor alternatives, bigger bigger places. And, and society needs to step up and support us in these things. Um, I know that some malls have been repurposed mm -hmm. to be more livable places where you can walk inside. So, you know, uh, you're thinking about it. And that's, that's step number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I was, 
I'm a community college educator, so I have my own tech issues in my classroom, but um, I was coming to this because my children, who are 11 and 14, go to a school and I feel like everything is more and more uh, online. Like, they go to school, but they're Chromebooks. Like, their only homework is to work on Lexia, you know, and it's just like, the, I don't make that, I don't, we don't do it. We just are like, oh, yeah. you're not, you did do that. Um, come read. But anyway, um, I'm just wondering, I, I was hoping to get some ideas to take back to the school because it's actually a new charter school that's started in our town and they're very open to parent input. And so I know that one of the things they're going to say to me <laughs> when I show them, you know, stuff from the book or whatever, I, I still haven't gotten my stuff together, but they're going to talk about how they use the internet for differentiation. Um, in the classroom, right? So helping students, we have a huge disparity between students right now, bigger than it's ever been. They're, they're telling us, I mean, I don't know, but um, you know, with people who have learning loss, but then also like one of my sons is a little more advanced. And so instead of actually, they're a small school. And so instead of giving him any support to, to do more advanced things, he has to do stuff online, right? So. They're using it to be able to, what they say, reach more students, right, with different levels of things. So I'm just wondering if you've looked into that, worked yeah, on that. Yeah, and I have, to that. I have a playbook for you afterwards, um, and it's part of our solutions. I've written, um, you know, a way to do both, to use technology purposefully, um, and it's something you can actually bring to your charter school person, the, you know, the principal, right. that um, cites all the research about how to go about vetting products and um, kind of the, the whys and the hows. So yes, I mean, I think diversity in the classroom is a really, and the classrooms are getting bigger and bigger. I don't know about the charter school, but at our public schools, like well, there's 32 kids in a yeah, class have and they have a whole range. So and then you have um, languages. I mean, you know, there are a lot of kids that don't even know the language. We have about 70 percent Spanish speaking students. Right, right. 30 percent English. So yeah, we'll talk more about that if you can hold on a minute. Um, yeah, cool. Good. Thanks. Thank you. And we have about two minutes, uh, so quick question. Great. I'll make it fast. Um, my name is Susie Fogarty. I am the strategic director for Smart Gen Society based in Omaha, Nebraska, with the goal to educate at least 100,000 kids within our community. Um, I get this great opportunity to go out and educate kids and parents on how to stay safe online. Um, what are the two biggest, if you could give me one speaking point for each, or for the students and the parents, what would they be? In terms of staying safe online, postpone the phone. <laughs> like, if you're ready for your kid to look at porn, give them a phone. Yeah, that's one of the messages we say. If you are not ready to talk about that with your kids, don't hand them the phone. Okay, what about for parents? Well, let me say something about phones. There are a number of different phones that are, uh, they look like iPhones, but they're not. They're not connected to the internet in the same way. One of them is Gab, Pinwheel, there's a bunch. I think it's a great trainer phone. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge advocate of training kids to be able to handle these things. Um, the parents about being safe online, uh, just keep the lines of communication open and don't be afraid of your child. If you want to put in uh, security on the phone, then darn, you know, do it and have some sort of agreement with them and the phone goes away if they violate it. The ki kids need boundaries. They're learning from you. And what we're learning in the classroom is that the kids are mirroring their parents. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we go out and say, you guys, you know, there's possibilities that you guys could possibly get addicted to your phones and they say, but our parents are. And when we go out and talk to the parents, they say, we're addicted to our, to our phones. We don't know what yeah. to do about it. We don't know how to help our kids. Yeah, I think there's um, zones in the home that should be cell phone free, yeah. and that does work. And I, it's not that I think that, I know that that works. Mm -hmm. You know, the kitchen table, the car, you know, places where you generally connect with humans. And, and we always say, you know, um, if you're with another person, there should not be a phone between, there should not be a screen between me and you, you and the teacher, you and your grandparents. Put it away, it's rude. Mm -hmm. um, 
and dangerous. I saw a kid walk into a mailbox the other day, <laughs> walking to the bus stop. He was like this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think modeling is good. Great, thank you so much yeah, for sure. what you do. Thanks for doing yeah. what you do. And I'm, I'm sorry, I think we're gonna have to cut the questions off here. Let's see if we have time at the end. Um, so, um, and let's talk afterwards. Okay. Sure, I just, I remain standing though, okay? Oh, until sure. we're done? Well, I don't know, let's see how we do. <laughs> So you really want to ask? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's, oh. it's a sit-in. <laughs> well, so it, it was just like, I'm a high school teacher. I don't think that my parents had any remote clue about how much damage they're doing to their kids sitting in the school. Because if they did, they wouldn't. So my question is like, how do I convince my parents that you're just hurting the kids? With the phones. Yeah. With yeah. The phones. This is really hard, and this is. Do you have a good PTA or PT essay or no. Uh, no, no? And our and our high school policies are garbage and don't work. And things like that. So I, I feel like relying on the school system to like send policies down is not effective. And so the only thing I can think of is to reach the parents. But I don't know how to reach them. You, you know, you command a lot of respect in your role. Um, Maybe it doesn't feel like it sometimes because I know parents can come down hard on teachers sometimes. But uh, generally speaking, teachers know what's going on in the classroom. And if you were to send a message home saying, here's the way I run my classroom, there will be no phones. You know, I, I feel like, I don't feel like, I've seen it happen in our middle school. And you can cite front office referrals go down 80%. Um, teachers don't get thrown up against lockers because they try to take a, a phone away from a kid. I mean, they're, I can help you write the letter, but it's, um, But do you think the parents would read it? Oh, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, and I can also tell you that, like, um, Mitt Romney, there are lots of elected officials who are actually creating programs to incentivize schools to go cell phone free mm -hmm. and to give them, like, special designation, like the Blue rib Ribbon Schools we have now. Um, so, um, yeah, try to just work with parents. Uh, as an authority figure, so she's talking about per person of respect. Um, so, but our 10 solutions may spur some ideas in your mind too. Right, so and I, obviously the first one is to get rid of the phones. Um, shoe organizers, cell phone cubbies, um, these are all really good. And obviously the lockers, if you have enough to go around, our school doesn't have enough lockers to go around. Um, stuff them in the backpack, make sure they're off. Cell phones are stealing focus, stealing friendships, stealing food. Like I have heard from parents, their kids don't eat lunch because they go to lunch room and they're like, they have their face on the phone and they're starving when they get home. Talk about being unavailable to learn. If you're hungry in the middle of the day, um, the second big thing is insist on getting these products vetted. Talk to your administrators and say, before you're asking me to use Flipgrid or Pear Deck or whatever it is, show me that it works. Show me that it does something better than I can do. Um, evidence. We need evidence. And actually, I wonder if any of you are doing little trials in your own classroom. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I, I, my name is Ricky. I'm from Australia. Hi, Ricky. I'm going to come out and have a, well, I guess, a learn a bit about the American education system, some of the challenges and the conversations at the forefront of school minds and leaders and principals. Um, we, I'm a uh, music teacher in schools and working in a lot of primary schools. Um, I was wondering, interested if you had followed um, the mobile phone ban in New South Wales public schools. Yeah. Because um, it's shown significant. And uh, if that's something that you could do here. Uh, well, actually, there's a whole movement associated with our group, the Screen Time Action Network. I would look them up. They've got a whole bunch of resources there for you to be able to speak to your school about technology. And there's a movement starting in the U.S. now of trying to have phone-free schools. Uh, a whole bunch of parents are starting. They're having really good traction with it. And so we will look toward data like that, you know, to see how good examples of where it's working in school districts. Clearly, um, there's less um, stress among the teachers 
um, the children report being relieved and um, they're doing more learning. So thank you for, for bringing that up. The difference is in a lot of other countries, your kind of upper level government can dictate what happens at local level. We can't do that here. Um, so uh, we have to kind of work locally and like, I'll talk to you afterwards, but yeah, it's, you guys are killing it. It's not something that at a state level could be done across state, for example, school, schools. school districts, it's yes. Local. And so yeah. uh, you didn't mention your special uh, resolution. Yes, I didn't. So yeah, the resolution that during the pandemic, I put all these thoughts together into something I call the digital balance resolution. It's a number of pages long. It cites research. I presented it to our 210 PTAs in our district. We have a huge district. Um, it got voted in, which is how you have to do it in our district. You have to get the votes of the PTAs. And then I brought it to central office thinking that they would say, oh yeah, that's cute. But they actually didn't. They said, love it, need this. Um, they rolled it out last September with teacher trainings about how to minimize tech. And a lot of the tenants in this document are in our solutions. Um, and I got letters from teachers, like this is a handwritten note I got from a teacher recently that said, I've been teaching for 25 years. I'm about to quit my job because I can't compete. Mm -hmm. I can't compete with the phones. And I'm asking to be um, an IT person. I, I don't do this. So um, yeah, so like back to our solutions. Um, the third one is always offer an offline alternative to tech. Um, you'll be really surprised at how many kids take it and how many families want it. Um, on paper. Paper, yeah. A lot of teachers tell me that this, um, handing out a notebook in September, just a plain old spiral bound notebook, and doing, you know, one week write a poem, one week just doodle a picture of your favorite pet, um, just free write, which I remember doing. I really love doing that. Um, just a simple notebook and putting the hand movement to the paper connects to the brain and it's very good for the well-being as well. And also assignment books. And assignment books, yes. Agenda books are a really good idea to help get kids organized. Um, our school gives, the middle school gives them every year and unfortunately the teachers forget to use them because now we have Canvas, Synergy, and Remind and that's how they tell the kids about the assignments, even though they're not supposed to have cell phones in school. It's a bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth thing, and this is not gonna be popular in this convention center, but is to be beware of AI. Um, just this past Monday, the National Education Policy Institute released an urgent call for oversight of AI in schools. It's a 41 page report. Like I said, it came out Monday. It's really interesting, and I'll just read their kind of thesis statement, and I'll quote, integration of AI can degrade teacher-student relationships, corrupt curriculum with misinformation, encourage student performance bias, and lock schools into a system of expensive corporate technology. <clears throat> it goes on from there, but do question AI. Um, and then the fifth thing is read, 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 read as much as kids can bring um, magazines and newspapers into the classroom and give them time to just float around and read what they want to read. Um, encourage them to go to the media center, get a library card. They'll roll their eyes, but it, it, it makes a significant impact on their ability to do life and do school. Okay, so I'll pick up at number six. I saved the statistic till now about sleep. Um, those teens who rel routinely stay up past midnight um, have a 25 greater risk of depression and a 20% greater chance of suicidal thoughts. And so that can end with you by eliminating mid midnight deadlines for papers or any assignments. Even if it's the default in the software, override it, put in another time that's earlier you can have a direct impact on these kids' health. And so I just I encourage you to be an activist, to be someone who's gonna advocate for your kids. 
and just tell them, hey, you know, I know it says that, but I want them by seven. I, I want you to turn it in earlier. Um, it's gonna make a, a big difference because kids need their sleep. And about kids' eyesight, I'm gonna teach us all a routine that we can use for our lifetimes and you can help the kids understand it. Um, to keep eyesight versatile so you can see this focal length and the back of the room. Um, and also, so your eyes don't get painful and you don't get a headache after staring at screens for too long. Uh, the 20-20-20 rule is for every 20 minutes, look up past the screen at something at least 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And I can tell you from personal experience as a writer who has to stare at a screen every day for a lot, I do it and I immediately feel relief in my forehead and my face and my eyes doing that every 20 minutes. And so that's something you can do. Um, and every 20 minutes or at least every hour, have everybody in the class get up and move, stand up. That actually keeps the metabolism going through the day so the sedentary diseases don't set in. And um, so that's something you can help them with. Um, it's also a brain break. Uh, the research is showing that we can ingest information for an hour, maybe two max, and then it, that's when you start reading the same sentence over and over. Okay, so that's why having this break uh, just for half a minute, a minute, every hour, allows that information to sort of percolate and the log jam breaks up. When they sit back down, they're refreshed. Uh, something else you can do to increase activity in their lives is to have the active lessons that involve movement. Um, and to encourage bike to walk, bike and walk to school day. Uh, almost many schools have this, and it's a really great thing for kids to be able to get rid of some of this, the uh, 60 minutes that they need to have, and that's the thing about it. 60 minutes is not so daunting if you understand that the kids can take it in chunks. So if it's um, you know walking the dog plus recess plus you know playing in the afternoon, they have their 60 minutes. So you can help with. Um, by opening playgrounds in the morning and afternoon is really helpful for that too. So try to advocate for that too. Um, mindfulness, uh, kids are stressed out. We can teach them techniques. I'm gonna tell you, cut to the quick on Inner Explorer. Uh, Inner Explorer is a five to 10 minute pre-recorded program where you press play and a beautiful soothing voice comes out with a mindfulness activity for the day for, this, for the child and it's um, ended with some journaling or a short discussion. It's made huge differences. It's in 4,500 schools across the country and increases performance um, and uh, reduces behavior problems in the classroom. And um, it's kind of a miracle worker. So look into Inner Explorer. And um, finally, number 10, uh, the best way for kids to be available is to have a teacher. So truly, um, UNESCO just came out with this, that uh, tech and education should be used to enhance learning and support student well-being, but should never replace in-person teacher-led instruction. So feel really good about that. Right now, feel it inside yourself and say, they need me. Um, <laughs> That's true. You guys brought them back from COVID. You're filling in that, that gap that was experienced. Um, and they will remember you. There's always that teacher, that uh, the weird teacher, the funny teacher, the teacher that cared a lot. Um, I, I have two of them, Mr. Baccarilla and Mrs. Sorensen, I would have to say. But you know, that's who you remember as you go off into life. Um, so be you, do you, and right. do the great stuff that you do. And no Thank machine you. can replace your smile or your nod. It's just it's not going to happen. Absolutely. And as far as the kids themselves, never lose sight of their foundational needs. And um, so you can make them the most sensational young humans that they can be. So thank you very thank much you for your attention. <laughs> Any more questions if anyone wants to hang out? Yeah. If we're allowed, but we'll have to shut up, but you can come speak to us. Yeah. <laughs>